The Book of Job, Part 2. We saw in the first Bible study of this uh, series of Job that Satan tempted God in the controversy that exists between God and Satan and probably tempt is really too strong of a word but um, Satan got God's approval to test Job. In other words, God knew what manner of man Job was. He chose him from the foundations of the world as he's chosen all his election and or remnant which Job would be considered. And God knew what manner of man Job was and that he would not crack under the pressure of Satan. So God allowed Satan to destroy Job's livelihood, to take his wealth, and to destroy his children. And of course Job is very grieved by this. He doesn't understand why this is happening. He doesn't understand who is responsible for this, though he should, because Satan is always the bringer of all evil and corruption and trial and tribulation upon man, that is to say, uh, after this manner. I mean, man brings quite enough trial and tribulation upon himself and upon others as he does so in his corruption, but at any rate, Job's um, three friends, uh, quote-unquote friends, uh, come to try to comfort him, and at first, they approach him with comforting words, saying, Job, you've been such a good man. You helped the needy. You, you helped the... Uh, the weak to stand upright. You, you've been such a good man. You've always done the things of God. But now they've turned on him because they are um, self-righteous. They're looking down their nose at Job. They're convinced that he's done something wrong. This Job, I mean, God would not do this to anyone. Of course, it's not God that's doing it, and none of them, even Job himself, understand this. It's Satan that is bringing this about. So these men are using their earthly, fleshly wisdom to try to justify their own beliefs and say things to Job which are accusatory in nature. Job, you must have done something wrong. Your children must have done something wrong. No, God just doesn't do this to people. You need to confess. You need to do this. You need to do that when they don't even understand what's going on here. Nor does Job. And um, quite frankly, they're giving him a bunch of bad counsel. Though they are using some righteous words, and I could even say true sayings, they're using them in the wrong application against Job. Because Job has done nothing wrong. Job is simply being tested. And Job is an example to us especially in these times of just how Satan will tempt you and pick on you, especially if you're one of God's election, because Satan knows God's election very well. He always knows his enemy. So bear that in mind as we read these scriptures, and we're going to pick it up here in Job chapter 6 and verse 1. And before we begin, as always, let us ask for guidance, wisdom, understanding, and the truth of the matter from our Father in prayer. So let us pray. Our glorious Heavenly Father, a just and righteous Father in which there is no iniquity, we come before you today, Father, with open minds and open hearts, seeking truth. And we seek truth from you, Father, and from your word, because we know that your word is living, that it speaks to many generations, that it says things that other books cannot say. We ask that you open our eyes and ears to the truth, Father, and all those who study with us. We ask that your hands always be upon these studies, Father, and that you be our light and you be our guide, because we know that you are the giver of all wisdom, the revealer of secrets. And we ask these things, Father, in faith, according to your own words. 
In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yahushua Messiah, Amen. So Job chapter 6 and verse 1, and we're going to pick it up from where uh, Eliphaz has been speaking to Job and accusing him, and now Job is going to answer. If you recall in the last lecture, so uh, Job is going to answer what was said to him. So Job chapter 6 and verse 1. But Job answered and said, verse 2, All that my grief were thoroughly weighed, and my calamity laid in the balances together. In other words, that you could see how heavy a burden this is upon me. Verse 3, For now it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore my words are swallowed up. In other words, Job doesn't have any way to uh, really impart to these people who are his supposed friends how heavy a burden this is upon him and the burden is not from God remember it is from Satan but of course he is suffering not only has he lost all ten of his children which would destroy any parent but he's lost his livelihood his wealth he's now diseased from head to toe with boils which keep erupting out not healing up, and uh, of course Job does not understand why this has come upon him, being that he's always been a righteous man and always tried to do the right thing. And many of you could, today can probably relate with this. You know, I've often uh, been written by people and asked, why do the uh, why do the atheists or people who have no mind towards God, seem to prosper, and those of us with faith seem to suffer more, or we can't get ahead in life. Well, the answer is quite simply that the world loves the worldly. The flesh loves the fleshly. And God expects more of his election. He expects us to be able to endure more and to take more. You know, Christ didn't make it easy on himself when he came. You know, he was crucified. He was scourged. He was spat upon. Um, he was called a heretic. They said he had a devil. You know, so if it wasn't for easy for him or for the prophets which preceded him or the apostles that came after him, then we of the election today should not expect it to be easy on us. Life is always full of trials and tribulations, and life is a very hurtful thing at times. Whether it be through loneliness or uh, just the pain of aging, you know, looking in the mirror and not seeing your eyes be so bright as they were when you were a younger man, and hair loss, and you know, age spots, and everything that comes along in this life. We know those things aren't natural to us. Some portion of our soul down deep inside of us, though we're not aware of it necessarily, knows that this is not natural. It is not natural for us to age. It is not natural for us to feel pain like this. It's not natural for us to hurt. However, since we are in the flesh and bound to all these things, we do hurt. So again, Job does not understand why all this has come upon him. To continue, verse 4. For the arrows of the Almighty are within me, and the poison whereof drinketh up my spirit. In other words, his spirit is, is being devoured by this pain and by this bereavement. And the terrors of God do set themselves in array against me. Well, he only thinks it's of God. It was not God that was doing this. Rather, it was Satan who has done this. Now, God would expect Job, I'm sure, to understand that um, when evil comes upon a person, that it is not of God. But God is using Job here as an example to Satan. He's showing him that, you know, you, you can do whatever you want to Job, but you're not going to crack him. Verse 5. Doth the wild ass bray when he hath grass, or the lower, 
or the lower the ox or the loweth excuse me, let me try that again, or loweth the ox over his father. In other words, uh, even in nature, does an animal cry out or complain for no reason? In other words, when there's plenty of grass, you won't hear a wild ass bray, which is to say call out, or an ox loweth over his fodder. Got no reason to. So Job is not complaining here without reason. In his mind, I'm sure he's being treated unfairly because he doesn't understand what the cause of it is. Verse 6. Can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt? In other words, can you eat bland food without salt, without any seasoning in it? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? In other words, what Joe is making the compar- Job is making the comparison here is what good to anyone is anything that is tasteless? And these three, three friends of Job are tasteless, without savor. Because they are using the words of men and not the words of God, and they're accusing him when he's done nothing wrong. Verse 7. The things that my soul refused to touch are as my sorrowful meat. In other words, the things that Job or any rational human would want not to come upon them or not to happen to them came upon Job without cause, at least in his mind, and they have become his sorrow. In other words, he's eating the meat of sorrow, and he doesn't understand why. Verse 8. All that I might have my request, and that God would grant me the thing I long for. In other words, Job is in sorrow, he's in pain, he's in sorrow for his children and his possessions and his servants, and he feels that he has no purpose left. So he would like to go on and die and be with the Lord and be out of pain. I mean, many times you see people or you know, some of you do, I know I have, have gone to nursing homes and I have seen there people sitting there in front of a little black and white television or a little uh, crappy TV that doesn't even have cable, just has an aerial antenna and they're sitting there like there's no life in them, glaring at the television. It's like they're not even there. And half of them are either asleep or drooling. They're simply waiting for death. They're old and probably have very little family and no one comes to visit them and they feel forgotten. And uh, I have known people, even good Christians, who uh, would often tell me, uh, whenever the Lord's ready, so am I. I've lived my life and I've done all I can do and I'm ready to go at any time he calls me home. So Job would like to be back with God and be out of this suffering. Very understandable. Verse 9. Even that it would please God to destroy me, that he would let loose his hand and cut me off. In other words, that God would allow Job to die. Again, Satan has caused this sorrow, not God. Verse 10. Then should I have comfort. Yea, I would harden myself in sorrow. Let him not spare, for I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. You know, Job is saying here that he wishes God would just allow him to die, because Job, uh, in a manner of speaking, all of his life has tried to do the right thing and has not hid his candle under a bushel, so to speak, you might say. He's done the right things. And he's spoken the right things with regards to God. He's lifted others up. And yet all this evil has come upon him. And again, you out there who know the truth, who are of God's election, you know, these things, these trials and tribulations are going to come upon us. It's the way it is. That's part of the test. We are tested right along with those who know not the truth. Verse 11. What is my strength that I should hope? 
And what is mine end that I should prolong my life? In other words, what Job is saying here is, what have I got left? Job was wearied and ready to die. Now Job's hope should be that, or Job's hope should have been God, in other words. But in this situation, he's really hurting. Not only literally in the flesh in pain, and, uh, you know, he's grotesque looking because of all these sores. And uh, he doesn't feel like he's going to see good anymore. And th there's nothing left to hope for. He's, he's ready to go to the Father. Verse 12. Is my strength the strength of stones or my flesh of brass? In other words, Job was only human. Now, it, basically what he's saying is here, I, I'm not as strong as the rock, and my flesh isn't made of brass. I'm only human. Verse 13. Is not my help in me? And is wisdom, which is probably better translated stability, driven quite from me? In other words, his help within him was as nothing. No way to comfort himself except the thoughts of being released by death. In other words, being allowed to die. Verse 14. To him that is afflicted, pity should be showed from his friend. But he forsaketh and feareth the Almighty. And this word but would be uh, better translated lest. So let's read that as it should be. To him that is afflicted, pity should be shown from his friend. And his friends are obviously not showing him any uh, comfort. Lest he forsaketh the fear of the Almighty. In other words, his friends aren't showing him any pither. Rather, they're accusing him. In fact, by their words, they're making the comparison that... Um, or Job is making the comparison that... They could drive him or, or any man from the reverence of God by their stupidity, by their words of ignorance. They aren't comforting him at all. In fact, they're making things worse. They may be saying good-sounding words, and uh, some of the words are even truthful in, a, in an aspect, but they're not being used in the right application towards Job. In other words, these are men without counsel. Like, rather like a lot of the pastors and priests and reverends today. Verse 15. My brethren have dealt deceitfully as a brook. As a stream of brooks that passeth away. In other words, like streams of water that, you're, that are dried up and go away. They've dealt deceitfully with him. Again, they're accusing him. They're saying, you must have done something wrong. God doesn't just do this to people. Verse 16. Which are blackish by reason of the ice, and wherein the snow is hid. In other words, frozen over so that the water cannot be reached to drink. Frozen over with ice and hid with snow. In other words, these, these men aren't doing him any good. They're not giving him any water to drink. The living water, that is to say. They're not doing any good whatsoever. Verse 17. What time they wax warm, they vanish. When it is hot, they are consumed out of their place. In other words, they dry up. And he's making the comparison to his three hens, or his three friends here, at how useless they are. As far as being any comfort to him to give him something to drink. Verse 18. The path of their way are turned aside. They go to nothing and perish. In other words, their, their words are worthless. Verse 19. The troops of Tema looked, and the companies of Sheba waited for them. And Sheba means oath. The seven oaths. Verse 20. They were confounded because they had hoped. They came thither and were ashamed because they trusted in vanity. In other words, he, he's making the same comparison to his friends here. They trusted in vanities, therefore they were ashamed. Verse 21. For now ye are nothing. Ye see my casting down and are afraid. 
In other words, you see me cast down, and now you have turned on me for your ignorance of the truth in, in desperation trying to explain this in your own minds to yourself and try to convince me. Verse 22. Did I say, bring unto me? In other words, did I ask you for anything? Or give a reward to me of your substance? Did I, did I ask you for anything? Or did I ask you to come here and uh, give me anything? Or, or, as a matter of fact, did I ask you for your words, which are uh, substance, all right, but it's not God's substance. It's another kind of material. Verse 23. Or deliver me from the enemy's hand, or redeem me from the hand of the mighty. In other words, did I ask you for any of this, any of this deliverance? Did I ask you to come here and accuse me and tell me what I'm doing wrong and what a sinful person I am? I mean, when, when you first approached me, I, I was Mr. Good Guy, and this was so unjust that it was happening to me, and then you've all turned on me. Verse 24. Teach me. In other words, lay it on me, guys. I will withhold my tongue and cause me to understand where I have erred. In other words, tell me where I have sinned. What have I done wrong? <clears throat> Verse 25. How forcible are right words? What doth your arguing reprove? In other words, how good are righteous words, but your words are worthless and your arguments are worthless. Verse 26. Do ye imagine to reprove words and the speeches of one that is desperate, which are as the wind? In other words, do you imagine to reprove me with your words of desperation, which are like the wind? You could even say, like hot air. In other words, Job is really giving him down the town here. Verse 27. Yea, ye overwhelm the fatherless, and dig a pit for your friend. In other words, you're setting a trap for me. You're, you're digging a pit for me. Verse 28. Now therefore be content. Look upon me. For it is evident unto you if I lie. In other words, look me in the eye and tell me these things. And accuse me. You should be able to discern if I am lying or not, since you are such men of wisdom. Verse 29. Return, I pray you. Let it not be iniquity. Yea, return again. My righteousness is in it. In other words, speak now and let your words not be iniquity. My righteousness, my righteousness has been self-evident. Remember in the beginning of this book, when they first approached him, they told him what a good man he was and how he had helped the uh, weak of knee and how he had helped people to stand upright and how he had uh, done many good works and now they've turned on him verse 30 is there iniquity in my tongue cannot my taste discern perverse things in other words am I lying do I know not know right from wrong I haven't done anything wrong a am I not able to discern that you guys don't know what you're talking about quite frankly Job chapter 7 and verse 1. Is there not appointed time to a man upon the earth? Are not his days like the days of an hireling? In other words, you, you go to work and then you get off from work. So are the days of men. In other words, y y you do your job and then your job's over with. It's time for you to go home. In this case, home being death. Verse 2. As a servant earnestly desireth the shadow, in other words, the shadow of a tree in the heat of the day, and as an hireling looketh for reward for his work, in other words, pay for his work. Verse 3. So I am made to possess months of vanity, and wearisome nights are appointed to me. In other words, months of emptiness and wearisome nights. I can't sleep. Verse 4. When I lie down... I say, when shall I arise? 
and the night be gone. For I am full of tossings to and fro until the dawning of the day. Uh, again, he can't sleep. He's in pain. He's covered with boils. He's lamenting over the loss of his children. He's got a wife that's not really supportive of him. She, she basically said, Joe, why don't you just go ahead and curse God and die? And you know, There's nothing like a good woman. Verse 5. My flesh is closed with worms. In other words, the, he's got bodily fluids running out and the worms are feeding on him. And clods of dust. My skin is broken and become loathsome. In other words, I'm, I'm horrible looking. A and the wounds keep breaking forth. Verse 6. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. In other words, the days of my life are going by. And nothing's changing. And spent without hope. Verse 7. Oh, remember that my life is wind. Mine eyes shall see no more good. In other words, wind being like we were discussing earlier, hot air. My eyes shall see no more good. In other words, Job thinks that this is it, you know. I'm not going to see any more good. This is why I want to die. Verse 8. The eye of him... <coughs> excuse me. The eye of him that has seen me shall see me no more. Thine eyes are upon me, and I am not. In other words, look, just look at me. A am I the Job that you once knew? You know that man that had so many riches and was such a good man? Now I'm just a shell of a man of what I was. Verse 9. As a cloud is consumed and vanishes away... So is he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. In other words, once you die out of the flesh, you're, you're gone. You're not going to resurrect from it. You know, the only time people ever resurrected from the death in their flesh body was when Christ arose them. Verse 10. Or, in the case of the one man that fell on Elijah's bones. Verse 10. He shall return mo no more to his house, neither shall he know his place any more. Why? Because he's dead. Verse 11. Therefore I will not refrain my mouth. I will speak in anguish of my spirit, and will complain in the bitterness of my soul. In other words, I I'm going to say what's on my mind, and what's bothering me, and how I feel about this. Verse 12. Am I a sea, or a whale, that thou settest to watch over me? You know, in these times, people would set a watch for uh, ships coming in to conquer them or whatever. But these men have, are, are watching over him, n not for the good, in other words. They're, they're, they're trying to pick him apart and see what they can find on him. Dig up some dirt. Verse 13. When I say my bed shall comfort me, my couch shall ease my complaints. Verse 14. Then thou scarest me with dreams, and terrifiest me through visions. In other words, vain visions. They're causing him to be unsure. This goes back to that verse just that we read a few back, that you could drive people away from, from the Almighty, from, from uh, terror of the Almighty, reverence of the Almighty. Verse 15. So my soul chooses strangling and death rather than my life. In other words, I'd rather be dead than to be living this life. And you know, there's an even deeper connotation here, if you with eyes can see it. Who is it that strangles souls and uh, causes them to choose death rather than life? Who is death? Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. A lot of people are going to choose death in these end times thinking that death is their savior. In other words, the Antichrist. Verse 16. I loathe it. I will not live always. Let me alone, for my days are vanity. In other words, empty. Uh, what he's saying is, I, I, leave me alone. I want to die. My, I, I will see no more good. My days are vanity. They're worthless. Verse 17. What is a man, or what is man that thou should magnify him? And that thou should set thine heart upon him. In other words, what are you so concerned with me for? And uh, sitting in judgment of me. Verse 18. 
and thou should visit him every morning and try him every morning. In other words, this would be like trial. In other words, they're trying him. They're trying to find something on him. In other words, what are you wasting your time trying to find something wrong with me? I haven't done anything wrong. Verse 19. How long will thou not depart from me, nor let me alone, till I swallow my spittle? In other words, till I choke on my own spit from arguing with you? Verse 20. I have sinned. What shall I do unto thee? O thou preserver of men, why hast thou set me as a mark against thee? Why am I a burden to myself? In other words, he's a burden to himself because he's still alive. He doesn't want to be alive. Verse 21. And why dost thou not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I shall sleep in the dust, and thou shalt seek me in the morning, but I shall not. Uh, but I shall not be. At least he's hoping so, anyway. Job chapter eight and verse one. Now number two is going to have his talk. Old Bildad, the shoe height. <coughs> Excuse me again. Job chapter eight and verse one. Then answered Bildad the shoe height and said, verse two. How long will thou speak these things? And how long shall thy words of thy mouth be like a strong wind? In other words, a wind is is something you can't see. Uh, in other words, you, you're raging against the uh, forces of truth here, at, at least in their minds. In other words, how long are you going to speak words of vanity? Verse 3. Doth God pervert judgment? Or doth the Almighty pervert justice? Now again, here's a here's a here's a true statement. God does not pervert judgment, and God does not pervert justice. But Satan does. And again, none of them are aware of what has transpired between God and Satan in heaven and what this trial and tribulation is all about. So the guy is speaking the truth, but by the wrong application. Again, like many pastors today who teach false doctrines thinking they're teaching the right thing. They will even say Jesus is the Christ and is the Lord, which is a true statement. The only problem is they don't know which Jesus Christ is the Lord. Because they only teach one. They don't teach about the false one. Verse 4. If thy children have sinned against him, in other words, Job, if your children have sinned against God, and he have cast them away for their transgression, verse 5, if thou wouldest seek God be times, in other words, over and over, and make supplication to the Almighty, verse 6, if thou were pure and right, surely now he would awake for thee. In other words, God would answer you and come to you and help you. And make the habitation of thy righteousness prosperous. In other words, what he's saying here is, this isn't happening, Job, because you've done something against God. You've done some evil or some horrible sin, which is a lie. He has not. Though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end should greatly increase. Verse 8. For inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and prepare thyself to search their father of their fathers. Verse 9. For we are but of yesterday, and know nothing uh, as compared to them, because our days upon the earth are a shadow, and uh, a shadow is fleeting. Verse 10. Shall not they teach thee and tell thee and other words out of their heart? And he's got that about right, out of their heart. Verse 11. Can a rush grow up out of the mire? Can the flag grow without water? Or, or can a rush grow up without mire? In other words, can a uh, water weed grow up without the mud to grow in? Can the flag grow without the water? In other words, this guy's now using some psychology here. Real, real keen and cunning one, this one, verse 12. Whilst it is yet in his greenness and not cut down, it withereth before any other herb. In other words, it's it's the first to die. Verse 
13. So are the paths of all that forget God, and the hypocrite's hope shall perish. Again, there's another true statement, but by the wrong application. Verse 14. Whose hope shall be cut off, and whose trust shall be as a spider's web. In other words, a snare, a trap. Verse 15. He shall lean upon his house, but it shall not stand. He shall hold it fast, but it shall not endure. Again, another true saying. Verse 15, 16. He is green before the sun, and his branch shooteth forth in his garden. In other words, he, he grows up out of the earth. Verse 17. His roots are wrapped around about the heap. And see at the place of stones. In other words, this would be likened to the parable given by Christ even. Uh, the seeds that were broadcast amongst the rocks rose up quickly. But because they had no depth of earth, when the sun rose, they withered away. So, this guy is not totally using uh, untrue sayings. He's just not using them to the right application because he doesn't understand what's going on. In other words, he's darkening counsel without wisdom here. You know, he's trying to imply that Job has done something wrong when Job has not. Now, every man sins. Even these are now sinning, but God's not attacking them. Nor is Satan, quite frankly, because Satan never attacks those that are of his own ilk. Verse 18. If he destroy him from his place, then it shall deny him, saying... I have not seen thee. Verse 19. Behold, this is the joy of his way, and out of the earth others shall grow. In other words, to him. Verse 20. Behold, God will not cast away a perfect man, neither will he help evildoers. Now, there is another true saying. God will not cast away an innocent man. Neither it will he help evildoers. However, God has allowed the evildoer to test Job here. And none of these understand it. Verse 21. Till he fill thy mouth with laughing and thy lips with rejoicing. Verse 22. They that hate thee shall be clothed with shame. And the dwelling place of the wicked shall come to naught. Again, another true saying, but not by the right application. Job chapter 9, verse 1. Now Job's going to answer him, and Job's, Job's going to scold him good. Verse 2. I know it is so of a truth, but how should a man be just with God? In other words, a, a man cannot be just with God. All men are born into corruption. All men are born into sin. The best they can do is repent from their sin. Luckily now we have an intercessor in, our, in Christ Jesus. But at this time there was no Christ. At least not in the flesh. Verse 3. If he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. In other words, if a man will contend with God, he will not be able to answer God even one of a thousand questions. Verse 4, he is wise in heart and mighty in strength, who hath hardened himself against him, and hath prospered? In other words, wise in his own heart and mighty in his own strength, and has hardened himself against God. And is, he, is this going to prosper? Verse 5, which removeth mountains, and they are not, and overturneth them in his anger? In other words, talking about God here, verse 6, which shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble? Verse 7. Which commandeth the sun, and it riseth not, and sealeth up the stars? Verse 8. Which alone spread out the heavens, and treadeth upon the waves of the sea? Verse 9. Which maketh Arcturus, Orion, and Pleiades, and the chambers of the south? In other words, which made the constellations and the stars of heaven? Verse 10, which doeth great things past finding out. 
In other words, beyond our ability to know. Yea, wonders without number. Verse 11. Lo, he goeth by me, and I see him not. He passeth on also, and I perceive him not. Why? He's in a different dimension. Verse 12. In other words, what he's saying is, no man can know the ways of God. Not completely. Or, or understand the mind of God. <clears throat> Verse 12. Behold, he taketh away. Who can hinder him? Who will say unto him, What doest thou? In other words, who can question God? Verse 13. If God will not withdraw his anger, the proud helpers do stoop under him. Verse 14. How much less shall I answer him and choose out my words to reason with him? In other words, me being a, a, a mortal man, how am I going to reason or argue with God. Verse 15. Whom though I were righteous, yet I would not answer, but I would make supplication to my judge. In other words, as righteous as I can be, I still can't stand up to God. So I wouldn't answer, but I would make supplication. I'd worship him and ask for forgiveness. Verse 16. If I had called and he had answered me, Yet would I have not believed that he had hearkened unto my voice. because, In other words, who am I that I should talk to God? Verse 17. For he breaketh me with the tempest, and multiplieth my wounds without cause. Now, again, Job doesn't understand that it's Satan that has brought him upon this, not God. And men in this time were superstitious, just as people in times past, in the medieval times, were suspicious. If something happened, then the devil made him do it, or uh, if some evil came upon them, it, it was of God's hand. Verse 18. He will not suffer me to take my breath. In other words, he won't let me die. But he filleth me with bitterness. In other words, he won't let me die. He fills me with bitterness and sorrow. I don't want to live anymore. Verse 19. If I speak as of strength, lo, he is strong. And if of judgment, who shall set me a time to plead? In other words, against God. Verse 20. If I justify myself, my own mouth condemneth me. In other words, there is no way a man can justify himself. If I say I am perfect... It shall also prove me perverse. In other words, no man is perfect. See, see the wisdom of Job here and the patience he has. All, all the patience of Job as it's written in the book of James. Verse 21. Though I were perfect, in other words, even if I was perfect, yet I would not uh, know my soul. I, I would despise myself. Verse 22, this is one thing, therefore I said it, he destroyeth the perfect, which is to say the innocent and the wicked. In other words, God can do this if he wills to. And this goes right back to the saying that Job said in the first part of this study. If we accept good from God, then should we also not accept evil? And the good man dies just as the evil man does. I mean, there are good men murdered. There are evil men murdered. You know, good people have been murdered. The prophets, the saints. But evil men have also been murdered. By other evil men. Verse 23. If the scourge slay suddenly, he will laugh at the trial of the innocent. That is to say, the tribulation of the innocent and uh, this is uh, probably the first real hint of doubt you see out of Job verse 24 the earth is given into the hand of the wicked he covereth the faces of the judges or the faces of the judges thereof if not where and who is he well Satan obviously verse 25 now my days are swifter than a post. In other words, a runner, one who goes and posts messages. It's where we get our word postman from. 
they flee away. They see no good. In other words, his days, verse 26, they are passed away as swift ships and is the eagle that hasteth to the prey. You know, if you've ever seen an eagle going after their prey, they, they'll dive. They can snatch a fish out of the water like, bam, that quick. Verse 27. If I say I will forget my complaint and leave off my heaviness and comfort myself, verse 28, I am afraid of all my sorrows. I know thou will not hold me innocent. In other words, even if I agree to forget my pain and my complaints and my bitter sufferings, you will still not hold me as being innocent. In other words, they don't think he's innocent anyway. They're against him. They've been trying to convince him this whole time that he's wicked or that he's done something. Verse 29, wrong. Verse 29. If I be wicked, why then labor I in vain? He had done right all of his life, this Job had. And if he is wicked, then, then uh, why has he labored for naught? In other words, for emptiness. In other words, he's had faith. Or, or else why would he have done all these things? Verse 30. If I wash myself with snow water, which, which is basically the purest water you can get, and maketh my hands never so clean. In other words, cleaner than they've ever been. Verse 31. Yet thou plunge me into the ditch, and mine own clothes shall abhor me. In other words, they would slam him back into the filth of the mud and, and, and dirty him right back up. Again, they're sitting in judgment of him. Verse 32. For he, that is to say God, is not a man as I am, that I should answer him. And we should come together in judgment. In other words, agree in judgment. Because man would seldom ever agree with God's judgment. I mean, look, look at how people treat the Bible and treat Christians now. There's nothing new under the sun. Verse 33. Neither is there any days, man, which is to say uh, arbitrator or intercessor betwixt us, that might lay his hand on both of us. In other words, to mediate between us. Well, thank God now we do have an arbitrator and an intercessor, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 34. Let him take his rod away from me, and let his fear terrify me. Uh, again, he doesn't realize it's Satan doing this. Verse 35. Then I would speak and not fear him, but it is not so with me. I am not what you think I am. A sinner, in other words, is what Job is saying here. Job chapter 10 and verse 1. My soul is weary of my life. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. In other words, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say these things that are bothering me, whether you guys like it or not. Verse 2. I will say unto God, Do not condemn me. Show me wherefore thou contendest with me. In other words, show me why you're against me. He doesn't realize again it's Satan. Verse 3. Is it good unto thee that thou should oppress, and that thou should despise the work of thine hands, and shine upon the counsel of the wicked? In other words, uh, raise the wicked up and allow me to suffer, who's been a righteous man? Verse 4. Hast thou eyes of flesh? In other words, are your eyes now the eyes of a flesh man that you see like a flesh man? Or see, or seest thou as a man seeth? Verse 5. Are thy days the days of a man? Are thy years as a man's days? Verse 6. That thou inquirest after mine iniquity and searchest after my sin? In other words... There had been plenty of sinful people on the world, and they had not been smitten, so why is Job being smitten? He's asking himself in his own mind. Verse 7. Thou knowest that I am not wicked, and there is none that can deliver out of thine hand. In other words, God, you know I'm not wicked, Father, and there's none that can deliver out of your hand, so why is this coming upon me? Verse 8. Thy, thy hands, or thine hands have made me. 
and fashion me together round about. Yet thou dost destroy me. Again, he doesn't realize it is Satan and to what cause this is being done. Verse 9. Remember, I beseech thee, that thou hast made me as the clay. Will thou bring me to dust again? Verse 10. Hast thou not poured me out as milk and curdled me as like cheese? Verse 11. And this is uh, a, uh, that last verse is an analogy of what's happening to his body. Verse 11. For thou hast clothed me with skin and flesh, and hast fenced me with bones and sinews. Verse 12. Thou hast granted me life and favor, and thy visitation has preserved my spirit. Verse 13. And these things hast thou hid in thine heart. I know this is with thee. In other words, what you're accomplishing here is hidden from me, but I know you know it. Verse 14. If I sin, then thou markest me, and thou wilt not acquit me for mine iniquity. Verse 15. If I be wicked, woe unto me. And if I be righteous, yet will I lift up not my head. I'm full of confusion. Therefore, seest thou my affliction, or see thou my affliction. Verse 16. For it increaseth. In other words, my, my afflictions are increasing daily. Thou huntest me as a fierce lion. And again thou showest thyself marvelous upon me. In other words, you're showing your power upon me. Verse 17. Thou renewest thy witness against me. In other words, daily. You're, 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 let's, let's just go on with the rest of the verse. And increasest thine indignation upon me. Changes and in war are, and war are against me. In, in other words, why is this happening to me, Father? Why are you against me? Verse 8. How, how many Christians, how many of you have ever asked God that? Why are you doing this to me, God? What, what did I do wrong? Well, you know, it's not always God that's doing it to you. And it's not always Satan. You can't always lay it to Satan's charge either. Sometimes you lose God's blessings just because. Because you turn your back on Him. Because you forget Him. <clears throat> Verse 18. Wherefore, or why then, hast thou brought me forth out of the womb? In other words, why did you bring me out of my mother's womb only to do this to me? Oh, that I had given up the ghost, and no eye had seen me. In other words, that I had died from my birth. Verse 19. I should have been as though I had not been. I should have been carried from the womb to the grave. Verse 20. Are not my days few? Cease then, and let me alone, that I might take comfort a little. Verse 21. Before I go whence I shall not return. In other words, before I die. Even to the land of darkness of the shadow of death. Verse 22. A land of darkness, as darkness itself. And of the shadow of death, without any order. And where the light is darkness. And, uh, again, those of you with uh, eyes to see and ears to hear should be able to uh, discern a little bit more from that last set of verses there. Because in the end times, it will be darkness who will claim to be the light of the world. And he will bring the shadow of death upon men. Because why? He is death. Again, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. As written in the book of Revelation, they're all going to fall and worship him. And the elect are going to be persecuted by him. Just as this Job is persecuted. Maybe not after the same manner. But we're learning here how to conduct ourselves from Job. Because Job is not blaming God for this. I mean, he, he's asking God why it's being brought upon him. But he's not saying, God, you're doing this to me. You, you're, you're, you're breaking me down on purpose. And you're an unjust God for doing this. He's not turning on God. So, 
You know, th th there are a whole bunch of lessons that we should be learning from this. And uh, no man is perfect. Not even God's election are perfect. And, and God is harder on his election, just as the uh, military is harder on those that enlist or come into the service. You know, they, I've made this analogy before. They don't, when you sign up to go into the Army, Navy, Air Force, or Marines, they don't bring you in and sit you on a comfy chair and sit you in front of the television and throw a table full of DVDs out for you to watch and bring you a uh, a big old Coca-Cola or a milkshake and say, you're such a good guy for enlisting in the Marines. We're going to treat you so good. No. They take them and put them in barracks. They make them go to bed early and rise before the dawn. And they run them for miles and miles and miles and exercise them and break them. In other words, break that fleshly part of them and make them into disciplined instruments which can protect themselves and can kill if need be to protect themselves and can go to war for whatever cause. In other words, what I'm trying to say here is God is the same way with his election. He is preparing an army. He's making his election to understand the things of his word through the example of this one Job, who himself did not understand what was going on. But whether he understood or not, he still was not broken. He was not broken by Satan. He stood tall. He stood in righteousness, though he wanted to die as anyone in his position would. You know, losing one child would be bad enough, but losing ten, and losing everything that you've got, and being covered with sores, and having a wife that says, Job, just go ahead and curse jo uh, God and die. You know, and then you've got three friends that came to comfort you, and now they're pointing at you and saying, you've done something wrong, you're a sinner. Your children were sinners. God does not do this to righteous people. So you have brought this on yourself and you're trying to testify to us that you've done nothing wrong. You're a liar, Job. Now you know what it means. Persecuted. And persecuted is what Christ was and what the apostles were and what the prophets were and what many Christians down through the ages have been usually at the hands of Satan's children, or Satan himself, led, uh, his children led by him. So again, understand what this persecution actually means. It's an example to us. And as you read the book of Revelation, remember what Christ said. He that endures to the end will I give a crown of life. You know, and he's not lying about that. Our Father never goes back on his word. Therefore, gain strength from these things and see the frailty of man in this. You know, Job could not ex be expected to be delightful about this and say, oh, I'm so glad I'm being picked on and, uh, you know, that these bad things have come upon me and, and that my children died. You know, I, they really weren't that good of kids anyway. And, and, and my wife, you know, she, she supports me so good. You know, she, she, she's hoping I'll die too. Just like I am. I mean, hey, what a woman, huh? At any rate, uh, this is where we're going to end this study for today. And um, we'll pick it up in the next lecture with uh, Job chapter, I think it's, what was this one we just did? 10 or 11? Or wait a minute, was that nine? Okay, yeah, we had finished ten. Okay, we'll pick it up in Job chapter eleven in the next lecture, and we will continue with this. And we're gonna we're gonna hear from the next guy, the next one up to bat against Job, 
And uh, this is going to go on, like I said, for a while until we get to about chapter 40 and then God is going to speak. And God's going to set it all right. God's going to give them down the town and give them what for. They'll, they'll wish they hadn't even come close to Job. Just as it's going to be for many pastors and priests that approached Christ on the great and terrible day of the Lord and said, O oh Lord, in thy name have we done wonderful works and have we not cast out demons and in thy name done all these glorious things and, he, and Christ is going to say unto them, Get out of my sight, I never knew you. You knew not me, so I know not you. At any rate, as always, my beautiful, wonderful, loving brothers and sisters in Christ, and, and I thank you for your support and your kind words on my studies. Some of you have been really kind to me, far better than I deserve. And um, I, I do appreciate that, and I appreciate that you studying our Father's Word with me. And uh, I do my very best to bring these things forth as accurately as possible. And it's, it's not always easy, trust me. And I don't claim to be perfect. I'm sure I make mistakes, but uh, that's one reason that I'm hoping that you'll dive into the Word. And, uh, you know, don't, don't, hang in, don't hang around in the shallow end of the pool. Come on out into the deep. The water's fine. And uh, get into your Father's Word and start drinking of that living water. And uh, may our Father bless you with all knowledge and wisdom and understanding of his word. Those of you who seek his face and counsel, that is to say. And pray for those who walk in darkness, our, our brothers and sisters, which God sheds a tear for. Pray for them that their eyes will be opened. And if not opened here, that in the millennium. So that they won't be lost and they won't be a pain in God's heart that has to be cast into hellfire and burned up and blotted out. Because that is not his will. His will is that all should come to repentance, which is why he made this earth age of the flesh. To bring out the best and the worst in us. That's what the flesh does. It brings out the best in us and the worst in us. And you can see it in every day and every way. Whether it be a corrupt politician that will lie to your face, or someone who will selfishly march into a burning building, run into a burning building, to help others and give up their own life. You see it in every day, in every way. Some people will do their best to give you the truth and to feed you of that bread of life and that living water. While others will try to destroy you in the name of religion by blowing up your towns and flying planes into your buildings. Now, can you discern the difference between the two? And just because our president and people like the ACLU and the atheists say it's all because of religion, religion is all bad and religion is the cause of all the problems in the world, do you bite on their little stupid fish hook? Are you that gullible? You know, I'm going to take just another minute here or two. A teacher was fired in New Jersey uh, yesterday or today, it was on the news, for giving a Bible to a student. And this lawyer got on there and said, we will not tolerate this. There, There is separation of church and state. And we will not have any religion put into the schools. Oh yeah? Well, what is the religion of secularism doing in school? Well, what do you mean the religion of secularism? There's no religion of secularism in school. Oh, isn't there? Teaching young, impressionable minds that they evolved from apes and that God is a myth? Showing them before their uh, age of accountability what sex is? And casting God out? Not allowing prayer in school and arresting people for praying at school? I mean, you know, how gullible do you think us Christians are? How blind do you think we are to what your agenda is, really? I mean, some may not see it, and I'm sure that delights you to no end. I'm sure it just makes you wet your pants with delight. 
You know, we've pulled another one over on them. Those poor, dumb Christians, we pulled another one on them. We slipped another law in on them. We removed another freedom from them. We took more ground from them. But we will not have any religion in school. Well, you know what? Uh, Non-religion is a religion. I hate to tell you that. Secularism, atheism, is a religion. I don't care whether you think it is or not. It is. Any creed, any set of beliefs, any set of values that you hold to is a religion. So don't, don't try feeding me this crap of this separation of church and state. Because uh, quite frankly, whether you people realize it or not that are doing this, you are the church of Satan. Even if you don't believe in Satan, you're the church of Satan. And, and you're going you're, you're gonna to fall and worship him in your ignorance. Because when he appears before you, claiming to be Christ, you're going to hit your knees so fast till you, you, you're going to bust your plastic kneecaps. And you're going to get a double whammy. Because not only had you been an atheist all your life, which isn't pleasing to God, but now you're going to foul yourself and dirty yourself even more by worshiping a Christ who is not the true Christ. And then when the true Christ comes, where are you going to be? I'll tell you where you're going to be. You're going to be hiding in the clefts of the rock. You're going to be getting under anything you can find to hide under, praying for the mountains to fall on you, wailing and gnashing of teeth. A shame to stand before God for what you have done. Your accomplishments of the great religion of atheism. Oh my, aren't we such highbrows? We can explain everything through science, brother. Or so we believe. At any rate, this is where I'm in the lecture, and I'm not going to get off on any more of a rant than I just did. I just wanted to bring to uh, the knowledge of those of you who are listening that a teacher has been fired and will probably now face charges for giving a student at school a Bible. In the United States of America, one nation under God, where we are guaranteed freedom of religion. That happened. Do you not see the hypocrisy in that? Well, do you know who Jesus called the scribes and Pharisees? What he called them? Hypocrites, which means play actors. Catch the wave, brother. See the spiritual type. Let the truth be revealed to your mind about these things. And uh, may God bless you, and thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts.